Are we on? Yeah, I think we're on. Hello, everyone. How how are you all doing? Um, I'm Chris. I'm joining you from Oxford, and I'm really excited to be with you here today to celebrate the launch of our latest position paper, Pronunciation for a Global World. I'm joined here today by the author of the paper, Robin Walker. Robin, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine, Chris. Fine. Really good to be here. Okay, good, good. Great to have you here. Um, I can see already we've got quite a large audience. Um, where is everyone joining us from? Uh, let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I can see we've got people from all over the world. Um, and yeah, we're really glad to have you with us here today to celebrate the launch of our position paper. Uh, we've been working on this paper for the last year or so, and we're really excited to share it with you. It's a really great paper with loads of useful advice, and it's on the topic of pronunciation. Um, there's a link to it down in the comments below if you want to if you want to access it. Um, so just as a quick introduction to us, I suppose, um, I'm Chris, I'm in the marketing team, and I do all the behind the scenes work for our position papers and our focus papers. So if you've read any of those, I'm the one who's putting on them online, setting up the webinars, um, organizing events like this, etc. Um, and I'm going to be organizing a bunch of activities and events on pronunciation for you later in the month. Um, so I'm excited to tell you about that a bit later on. Um, but first, me and Robin are going to be chatting a bit about pronunciation. Um, so Robin, do you want to um, let them know about you? Uh, yeah, <laughs> we could do. I don't think there's very much to know. Um, I've been in teaching for 44 years. And 40 of those years have been spent in ELT. And basically here in Spain, which is where I live, I spent a long time, over 20 years, teaching in the local university's School of Tourism. And this was really a fabulous experience where I was given a lot of space, actually, to see if I could really make this language teaching business work for my students in the School of Tourism. Um, I've done other things since. I got hauled very quickly into teacher training. And that's, I guess, been the other major string to my, uh, uh, to my bow. Um, loads and loads of teacher training. I'm looking at places that people are, are signing in from. And I've been to so many of them. And uh, with teacher training, obviously. All of this dragged me deeper and deeper into pronunciation teaching. And by about the mid 1980s, I was thoroughly hooked. And I've been hooked on pronunciation and how we can go about the business of, of teaching the pronunciation of English more effectively and more efficiently. How we can actually get our students speaking in ways that are intellig intelligible to other people. So yeah. That's about 25 years I've been very, very closely linked to the teaching of pronunciation. I'm a member of IATEFL's Pronunciation Special Interest Group. And for a number of years, I was actually editing the journal that the, the group produces, which is about the best place you can go at this moment in time if you want to get up to speed on how to teach the pronunciation of English. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> nice. Well, great to have you here today. Um, and yeah, hello to everyone. Um, I can see we've actually got people from all over the place. We've just had a couple of you pop up there. Um, but really great to see we've got so many people from loads of different places. Um, if at any point you want to ask us any questions or you want to respond to anything you're saying, or maybe tell us a story about your own experience with pronunciation or with teaching English, just pop it in the comments. Um, we love to hear from you. Um, and yeah, we'll, um, we'll try and get back to you on any questions you have. Um, so, right, that's us. Um, just a little bit about today. Um, today we're going to be talking about pronunciation. Um, and if I, if you, if you've just joined us, um, we recently launched a position paper on the topic of pronunciation for a global world, which you can download on our website. Um, there's a link showing up now, and there's one down in the comments. Um, and this this paper is part of a series of papers written. Each of them are written by an expert panel. And they provide loads of advice and guidance on important issues in English language teaching, like assessment for learning or learner agency. And this one is on pronunciation and gives expert advice to help you teach more effectively, um, help your learners communicate in the global world um, and really be intelligible 
in their pronunciation. Um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to discuss some ideas from the paper that can help you support your teaching. Um, again, if you've got any questions or comments, pop them in the chat box and we'll answer them. Um, but before we dive into your questions for us, um, I actually have a few questions for all of you in the audience to sort of open up our conversation today. So if you all want to get your fingers on your keyboards, um, I'm sure Robin's going to um, supply some of his thoughts on this in a moment. Um, but I think let's go broad first. So this is for everyone. Um, just a general question. Why is it important to, de to teach pronunciation in the English language classroom? Um, why, why should it be taught? What's important about it? Um, yeah, pop your comments in, um, in, the, in the comment section below. Um, and while we're waiting to hear from you, um, Robin, could you tell us a little bit about why pronunciation should be taught in the language classroom and what's important about it? Well, I think the first and most obvious thing, and it's, it's not just about teaching the pronunciation of English, it's teaching the pronunciation of any additional language that students might be learning, is that we're learning a language to communicate and very often we want to communicate through speaking and so pronunciation is just a vital part of that intelligibility that we aspire to as we're learning, learning a language. So number one, obviously, you know, we want to be intelligible and pronunciation is an absolutely central part of that intelligibility. And that's really particularly true with English, where the pronunciation is perhaps a little bit more complex than some other languages. The other thing that I think is often overlooked is that our students actually in surveys report again and again and again that they see pronunciation as a very important part of learning English. And we do try our best to work in student-centered ways, but I think that the sort of information that's coming out of surveys that have been done at the end of the 20th century and then repeated in different places around the world in the current century, I think that sort of repeated information that students really do value work on pronunciation isn't perhaps made public enough to us as teachers. So perhaps we might underestimate its importance in that respect. Uh, another thing that I think is really important is that we, we are really quick to jump at the idea of, yeah, we need to get some vocabulary out there and we need to get some grammar out there um, you know, perhaps we should start to see language as a stool, and stools have three legs. And grammar and vocabulary are two of those legs. But the third leg is pronunciation. Now, you take a leg away from any stool, and it ceases to function, or it becomes incredibly unstable. You take the pronunciation out of English language teaching, and what you're doing becomes incredibly unstable. So these, I think, are some of the reasons why we, we should uh, take time out and think about the teaching of pronunciation. It's really, really important. I think, yeah, I think I absolutely agree with you there. I think it's, it is so, so important to, as a part, it, it, as you say, it's one of the key elements. Um, and I believe you were, um, we, we were chatting the other day and um, there was something really interesting you said about the fact that um, in most, well, while it's this as you say, it's a stool, so it's a big important section of English language teaching. If we say there are three important legs, but within most course books and most curriculums, it's given. Was did you say about ten percent was, <laughs> was the number? Yeah, it's if you just flick through course books, you discover that it's it's given them a sort of a, a more marginal role, mm. and that a lot of time is spent on the teaching of grammar. Um, but that doesn't reflect how important pronunciation is to actual successful spoken communication. So there's a mismatch between how much time we dedicate to grammar and how much time we should be dedicating to pronunciation, given how essential it is to spoken communication. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think I think everyone's agreeing with us here as well. Um, I've shown we've shown a couple of comments earlier, but um, a lot of people are mentioning how important it is to be understood. Yeah. Um, and how important this it's, it's to... incredibly frustrating, actually, when you're learning a language. Um, I'm just thinking of different languages that I've tried to learn over my lifetime. And when you can't pronounce words, 
it, it really undermines your confidence. Mm -hmm. Or if you pronounce words in what you think is the correct way and people clearly don't understand you, then you become more and more reluctant to actually speak and to take part in conversation because you get all of this constant negative feedback. Mm -hmm. um, it's, <laughs> it's the basis. It's absolutely fundamental in fact yeah especially yeah, in absolutely. English, which has special complications with its pronunciation mm -hmm. but it's absolutely fundamental for any real progress uh, in the language yeah, yeah. Mm, fantastic well okay um i think yeah we've had loads of great answers there thank you robin mm. um thank you everyone in the comments um to move us on to our next question and again this is for everyone in the audience um because i think actually with pronunciation, while it's so important, lots of people are trying to do different things with pronunciation. They have different goals um, and they're pursuing different um, aims. So I suppose our question to the audience, and then Robin, I hope you'll follow up with this, um, is what is your goal when teaching pronunciation? Um, what are you trying to achieve when teaching pronunciation? Um, so everyone, if you could, in the comments, um, just let us know what you think. What is the goal when teaching pronunciation? What are you trying to do in your classrooms? Um, and yeah, let us know what you think. Um, Robin, what are your thoughts on this? I'm just looking to see what comes up from people. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start with a confession, Chris. And for the first years of my teaching, there absolutely was no specific goal. I was not conscious at all of a goal. As a native speaker, uh, learning how to be an English language teacher, I was incredibly conscious of when students' pronunciation didn't feel right, which could be that simply I didn't understand what they were saying, or could be that it felt to me that it was uh, radically different to what I expected, even though I had understood what they'd said. So for rather too long, uh, even perhaps as long as the first almost 10 years of my teaching, I had no specific goal for my pronunciation work. It was ad hoc. Something felt wrong, I dealt with it there and then. Mm -hmm. As I moved deeper and deeper into communicative approaches to language teaching, I also realized that um, what had driven my ad hoc interruption, uh, interjections and, and corrections and everything, was the fact that they weren't like me, they weren't like a native speaker. And then communicative approaches began to make it clear to us that this wasn't actually uh, a realistic goal. And that was uh, a far more relevant goal would, was that they would be comfortably intelligible to native speaker listeners. So that someone listening to somebody speaking English wouldn't have to work really, really hard as a listener in order to understand them. And this became my goal through the 90s, I would say. And then towards the end of the 90s, I came across the work of Jennifer Jenkins. And this caused a new shift in my own thoughts on what my goal was for uh, pronunciation work with my students. And it fitted in very nicely with what I was working on with my students who remember they were tourism students. And they were going to deal with people from all over the world, probably here in Spain, and often through English as a, a common language, a shared language. And it was this which tallied in so nicely with the work of Jennifer Jenkins and on the pronunciation of English as an international language. And having read her work and having studied her work, uh, this then became my goal. I'm walking into the classroom to help my students communicate in English, but this English is going to be used as an international language, possibly with people from Germany, possibly with people from other, uh, from the Scandinavian countries. And my goal then became that my students should be comfortably intelligible, but instead of native speakers being the judges of what was comfortably intelligible, the judges would become other non-native speakers that they were working with. Mm. I think that's a really interesting movement in terms of going from just because you're a native speaker doing what you think feels right to helping people be more understood by native speakers to taking that international approach. Um, I think we have a lot of, there's a lot of similar thoughts in here. So um, a lot of people, um, Adriana, hello, um, is talking about the main goal being intelligibility, which you've talked about a lot. Um, we've also got another comment about um, the goal is to be, uh, to, is to understand the language mm -hmm. um, and also to make students speak clearly so they can be understood. Um, 
And then another about, I want my students to understand every single word, word and the sentence. So there's a lot here about both making yourself understood and being understood um, by other speakers. Um, so I think everyone here is very much um, on the on the same page in terms of um, in terms of what the goal is. Um, I actually think so. We have another question that's going to pop up. Our next question was going to be: Is it important to be a native? Can I just inter interrupt to wind this? Is, what's interesting for me, Chris, is that. I think pronunciation more than anything else has an actual default goal. Mm. It's sort of like when yeah. you take, if you, if you take like a, a, a tablet out of a box, it has default settings about how it should be used and you can customize them and you can change them, but it comes with default settings. And I think with pronunciation, almost more than with any other area of English, the default setting is that you should sound like a native speaker. Yeah. And it, quite important that as teachers we step back and say okay this is how it comes out of the box mm -hmm. this is the mm -hmm. factory default setting mm -hmm. but is this setting actually of use to my students mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so actually if you're if you're working in the UK and your students are trying to settle and live in the UK then perhaps something close to a, a, a native speaker accent might be the relevant goal but if your students are more likely and I'm, I'm looking at the people in the chat box and where they're coming from in the world, and this is the case for most of the people in the chat box. Your students are more likely to be using their English for international communication, most frequently with other non-native speakers in big companies and in international institutions. If this is what your students are going to do with their English, then surely the native speaker default setting isn't the appropriate goal. And the appropriate goal becomes international intelligibility. Mm, I think, yeah, absolutely. I think that's really interesting. Um, I think actually people have been asking questions like this. So um, Muhammad has asked, why is native ex speaker accent pronunciation considered superior? Um, and I think it's like you said, it, it kind of people think that's the default. Um, and they assume that the goal of pronunciation should be to sound like a native speaker. Um, but as you've said, it's... English is used all over the world. Um, it's it's something used by people in loads of different countries. Um, and when you're talking to people who aren't native speakers, does sounding like a native speaker make you sound? Is does it make you more understandable? Is is that necessarily the goal we should be pursuing? Um, and I think yeah, that raises some really interesting questions. Um, so I suppose that actually pops on to our next question, um, which is actually. Um, kind of a, a guess for um for people that something for people in the audience to try and guess um and the question is um how many native speakers do you think there are in the world and how many non-native speakers um so do you think there are more native english speakers do you think there are more non-native speakers um do you think there are double the amount of native speakers double the amount of non-native speakers what do you think um yeah everyone just if you if you have a guess or if you know pop it in the comments um and i think this will shape our thinking about how we do pronunciation. Hmm. Um, let's, see, let's see what comes up in the... Let's see, let's see what pops up. Yeah, let's, let's give people a moment to, to put their guesses in. I'm just looking at Walter's comment about BBC. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, the BBC pronunciation is a myth. There isn't a single pronunciation with the BBC. I listen to Radio 4 three or four times a week in the morning to stay in touch with things <laughs> happening in the UK. And it's totally fascinating. There is no such thing as a single BBC accent or a BBC pronunciation. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> and of course, and people are saying more non-native speakers. Yes, uh, we've got, so we've, we've got a few million at least. Yeah. More non-native speakers. A few million at least. Yeah. Um, Robin, do you want to give us the answer? Well, there's no hard and fast answer, but the best calculations <clears throat> place native speakers somewhere in the region of 380 million. 380 million. I, I think there's actually more native speakers of Spanish, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> but there's 380 million, more or less, native speakers of English. And this number is reasonably stable. 
because the populations of countries like the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and so on, these are relatively stable populations. Um, how you get to your numbers as to how many non-native speakers there are depends on when you term somebody to be competent. But if you find that people are doing their daily work through English, then we can more or less assume that they're competent and probably they're working at a level of B2, C1, um, around about that level of English. At this moment in time, the calculations done by people like David Gradle when he was alive estimate somewhere in the region of one and a half thousand million non-native speakers using English on a pretty regular basis in order to go about their professional or social lives or sports lives. So that's one and a half thousand million and that number is increasing. And again, the last time I watched David Gradle talk, he suggested that we would head towards 2,000 million. Wow non-native speakers of English by the middle of this decade, and that would then level off. But that the number of native speakers wouldn't have changed, let's leave it at 400 million to round up. 400 compared to 2,000, it, it's pretty impressive. Five, five times the amount, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah. And this is the first time that we know of in the history of humankind that we have far, far, far more non-native speakers than native speakers. And then what's interesting about this is that, of course, you, you have to start looking at the ownership of language. And this was something that Henry Widdison did way back in the early 1990s when he started to uh, stir things up, shall we say, by questioning who owned English. Hmm. Of course, mm. the answer to the question, who owns a language, is the users. Languages are not the property of government-organized uh, uh, language academies, such as we have here in Spain. Languages are the property of the speakers of the language. And so what's really interesting here is that we have far more non-native speakers at competent levels using the language on a daily basis than native speakers, and these people are equal owners, shall we say. They have as much right to modify the language to make it work for them as native speakers do. They have the right to coin new vocabulary and they do actually change the pronunciation. Mm. They influence mm. pronunciation because of the pronunciations that they bring to English from their, their first languages. Mm -hmm. So it's a really, really interesting situation. It's quite unique. That's really interesting. Um, I've actually, there's a question which popped up twice and someone else. Um, so Christina has asked, is pronunciation also taught to native speakers? Um, and, and Vicky also really <laughs> likes this question. So I think we need to answer it. Well, well Christina's question, um, I have no recollection whatsoever of having been uh, formally taught the pronunciation of English. What I do recollect from very early on is that because I came from the north of England and had an identifiable northern accent, I do um, recall the prejudice that was leveled mm. against us because mm. of the accent that we had. Mm. Um, so what happened was that you were taught to get rid of your local accent in order to be accepted elsewhere in the country. Fortunately, that situation is no longer the case in the United Kingdom and accents are welcome wherever they are. Uh, more or less, <laughs> well, yeah. uh, but uh, no, I have no recollection at all, and I don't think the pronunciation was ever taught at school in, in the way that we might be teaching pronunciation in second language classrooms. I don't, so, I don't, I don't recall that either. For me, no. um, it's it's not something which, yeah, it's not something which happened. Um, there is an interesting comment here from Trixie, which is similar to what we've just been saying. Um, so in in the Philippines, some people, yeah. Um, if you if you pronounce it differently from a native speaker, people assume you're uneducated. There's a prejudice around it. Um, and yeah, I think, as you said, that is something which in in the UK has been a thing less so now. But there has been, there is that sort of idea of RP English um, making you is being more valid somehow. But England is filled with different accents. America's filled with different accents. Um, native speakers pronounce English in totally different ways. 
Um, my parents are from Newcastle, and they sound completely different to how I sound because I grew up down south. Um, and yeah, there was that. There was that you prejudice. Well, you grew up down south, Chris, because you said Newcastle, but your yeah. parents would say Newcastle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I still have a couple words. Like it's strange. My accent. There are some words where I'll pronounce them like a northerner instead of like a southerner. So my accent yeah. sort of this weird halfway point. Uh, but it is. It's it's different everywhere and. I don't think we should judge certain accents as being superior to others. I think people can choose what accent goals they want to follow. Um, and if you want, if you want a native speaker accent, if that's what you're pursuing, fantastic. Um, but I don't think we should necessarily say a certain accent is superior to others. I, I think Trixie's uh, comment is is really important. Actually, mm. Mm. there is accent prejudice. It's all over. It's not just something to do with English. Accents produce all sorts of reactions amongst people. Accents mm. also produce that sort of reaction, the prejudiced reaction, that if you speak like this, you can't be very intelligent. Mm. This happens, mm. but like, like any other prejudice, it needs fighting against. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't accept that somebody was considered un unintelligent because of the color of their skin. And we shouldn't accept that people are considered unintelligent because of their accent in English. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely agree with that. that. That's so sort of obvious that nobody would actually uh, consider somebody to be unintelligent because they have a Scottish accent or a Welsh accent and so on and so forth. And we just need to extend that and stop mm -hmm. considering people's intelligence because of their non-native speaker accent. A non-native speaker accent is simply a regional accent from a different region of the world. That's all it is. And just yep. as uh, we defend uh, strongly in the United Kingdom the right to have the accent that we have according to which region of the United Kingdom we come from, then we need to start defending people's right to have the accent that they have because of the region of the world that they've come from. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, completely agree with that. Um, and I do also think on the flip side as well, um, the other thing to stress is that if if students want to pursue a native speaker accent and that's their goal, um, they can do that as well. Um, it's all very much about um, you can pursue the accent you want and you can retain your own accent if you want to. Um, and I think actually there's an interesting comment here, which I think brings us on to one of our... I'm loving Vicky's comment, actually. Vicky's oh, Vicky, comment. Vicky's comment's great. Um, I'm loving that comment because... I met this this person that I thought was Spanish. Uh, some friends introduced me to her. And when she spoke, it was obvious that she wasn't Spanish. It was obvious that she was Scottish. And she had also, and I love the words, a beautiful, soft Scottish accent. And that person has been my partner for the last 40 years. And she is Spanish, but she spoke English with a beautiful, soft Scottish accent. Oh, that's a lovely story. <laughs> well, accents are fabulous things. Oh, they're, they're great. They're, so they're, they're part of who you are, and uh, I don't think we should ever um, be ashamed of our accents. And we should stop seeing non-native speaker accents as failed native speaker accents. They're not. Mm -hmm. They are an accent in English which is clearly coloured in many cases by your first language or your first languages. Mm -hmm. And that's the accent I have when I speak Spanish. And so people recognize me as, as being from outside Spain in my origins. Well, that's true. I am. Um, and you can be upset about that or you can be proud of it. And I think we should start being proud of it. I think so. I think so. I actually think, and that's, I think this brings on, on to an interesting point, which is um, the next point, um, which is a comment here. Accent is different from pronunciation. And I think this is, this is the key point where you can have your own accent but you can still be unintelligible and you can still be understood. Yeah, um, accent is related to pronunciation. It's the way you pronounce things, the unique way that you pronounce different things uh, within the whole aspect of the pronunciation of English generates your accent. So, yeah, um, yeah. sorry, I, I kind of, yeah, I conflated two things there. Sorry, um, you know more about this than me, clarify. Um, yeah. It no, no, is, I, I, think, I think we, sorry, Chris, I think we have clarified your, okay, your yeah. pronunciation, the, the different ways you work on, uh, could be the consonants, it could be the vowels, it could be the supra-segmental features. 
Yeah. They all come together and each person will be unique in the way they bring these things together and the way yeah. they bring them together with their own different flavors will produce the accent yeah yeah that, sure. with which they, they speak english yeah. yeah makes sense sorry i think sorry i think the point i was i was trying to mention the question i was trying to bring up which i've just reformed in my head now um whether you can pronounce in a way um your, your pronunciation uh, effective pronunciation so being understood internationally, being intelligible, effective pronunciation isn't dependent on the accent you have. No, you, you, you just actually, there's just far too much data out there. I'm not talking about data through, through people's PhDs and that sort of thing. Just go out into the world and look at people speaking and you, you will find that they're being intelligible one with the other, mm -hmm. but they have different accents. So it's, it's actually not worth researching because it's so painfully obvious. You just need to be a member of the world and actually mm -hmm. see how people are using English. And as I say, I mean, there are two things that I listen to in the morning. One is Radio 4 with the BBC and the other is the BBC World Service. And you hear accents from absolutely everywhere in the world. And what you discover is these people are being intelligible and you're listening to them. Why? Because you understand them. You understand them because they're intelligible. So accent mm -hmm. is not per se a guarantee of intelligibility, but most accents uh, will be intelligible if they meet certain minimums. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I actually have a question wow, that's here. Fantastic, Marisa. Sorry, Marisa was fantastic. F Filipino teacher uh, teaching English in Switzerland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, the, the more English becomes this tool for international communication, the more we're beginning to get data from students saying that they're not really too phased at all that their teacher isn't a native speaker. And then, for example, with uh, bilingual classes here in Spain, students complain often quite bitterly when the conversation assistant arrives from the United States or from the UK, and they've been learning English for a long time and using English in their chats on the internet, but they can't understand the native speaker. Mm -hmm. so, which is quite, quite an ironic situation. Yeah, yeah, no, that is quite amusing. That does happen sometimes. Um, I suppose, I think one of the questions, um, before, before I pop into the question, which I was going to mention in the comments, um, I suppose one of the um, one of the questions which I think is important, considering we've talked so much about international intelligibility um, and being understood internationally, um, could you elaborate a little bit more for everyone um, about what international intelligibility means and what sort of the, the general principles behind it are? Well, simply, the, the first work researching international intelligibility was done exclusively with non-native speakers talking to non-native speakers. And this work was done by Jennifer Jenkins. And what she wanted was to get empirical data. She, she didn't want data from work done in a studio or work done by people being recorded and then listeners listening and saying, I didn't understand this or I didn't understand that. She wanted people who were a, in a conversation and trying to do something else, who weren't focusing on their pronunciation, and she wanted to see what happened when their communications broke down. Once she got enough data, she looked at when grammar was the cause of that breakdown in communication, when it was vocabulary, and when it was pronunciation, and when it was other issues. The actual results were quite interesting because grammar um, could be connected directly to a breakdown in communication between these non-native speakers only 4% of the time. Which goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how much time we spend on grammar in the classroom and how much time we spend on other things. Uh, vocabulary was behind approximately 30% of breakdowns in communication between non-native speakers. And pronunciation was behind almost 70% of the breakdowns in communication. So having established that pronunciation is the, the main cause of breakdowns, she then went on to analyze her data to find out what's happening when people are successful, when they're communicating internationally, that is non-native speaker or non-native speaker, 
And she found that different areas came out as mm, uh, fundamental in order to maintain international intelligibility. One of these were consonants, and the mispronunciation of consonants seemed to, again and again, mm, produce problems of, of uh, intelligibility. Another of these was vowels, but what was interesting here was that her data suggested that of the properties of vowels of English, the length aspect of English vowels was more important for intelligibility than the absolute quality of the vowels. Let me give you an example. If you take a, a word like B-U-S, bus, that can be pronounced bus or bus or bass, depending on where you are in the United Kingdom, but we know what we're looking at when it comes along the street and you get onto it. So that's an example of quality, and the exact quality with which people are producing the vowels wasn't found to be as important as the, the, the length issues. Mm. So that's consonants, vowels, in, especially in terms of their length. So, so, sorry, just, just, to, just to clarify for my own, my own understanding. Mm. So in terms of the quality, that would be bass, bus, mm. boos, and the length yeah. would be boos. What would be, be American sort of flavoured vowels versus English flavoured vowels versus yeah. Australian flavoured vowels and so on and so forth. And, and what's the difference between in, in terms of length? It's uh, the obvious differences are, are things like live and leave, where you oh, see okay. one is a short vowel and one is a long vowel, but more uh, less obvious and, and often not dealt with properly is the difference between things like, uh, for example, this was one my students regularly got wrong, the difference between crab and crap. <laughs> And my students would often talk about fish served with a crap sauce. Oh, no. Now, Spanish doesn't have long or short lengthening or shortening of vowels. Mm. So their ears just didn't pick up. When I'm saying crab, that's a significantly longer version of the same vowel as in crap. Yep. My students don't yep. deal with length as, as meaningful and therefore picked yep. up the short version and therefore produced the wrong word. No, oh, no, that's not that's not a word you want to be saying in the wrong context. I, 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 I'm sorry, I've actually seen it on menus, but <laughs> um, this is the second um, point. Then, so vowels are important, but particularly important is their length characteristics. The way you deal with consonant clusters, especially at the beginnings of words, turned out to be significant for international intelligibility. So, if you take a word like Spain. My students, because they're Spanish, will tend to add a little vowel and they will say a Spain. Mm. This drives teachers absolutely crazy. But it's a typical strategy for students learning English from a language that doesn't have complex consonant groups, that doesn't have three and four consonant clusters. Mm. Mm. Another typical strategy for dealing with consonant clusters, two, three, or four consonants together, is to eliminate one of them. So if we take my students and they say one day in class, I live in a Spain, and they pop, pop in a little, a little extra vowel, and I start pulling my hair out and saying, oh my God, pronounce it properly, pronounce it properly, and they go to the other strategy, which is deletion of one of the consonants, then from I live in Spain, we get I live in pain. And of course, you, you totally altered the word. Yeah, yeah. And then perhaps I say, no, no, that's terrible. That's even worse. So they have a second go and they say, I live in sane. Again, they've deleted a consonant, the, the p sound this time, and they produce something again, totally different. So this was the third area that Jennifer Jenkins' work pointed out as being important for intelligibility, which was these clusters, two, three, or four consonants at the beginning of a word. Mm. And then the fourth area that she found was really important was what we call tonic stress, or uh, more technically nuclear stress, but often referred to in course books as sentence stress. Mm. And uh, so this is such a, a, a wonderful characteristic of English, but not if you're not in control of it. So same mm. things like, I love teaching English. 
and you put the, the tonic on love, it's not the same as saying, I love teaching English. Mm, mm. Which is not the same as saying, I love teaching English. Yeah, yeah. They mean different okay. things. And, and this was the fourth area that, that Jenkins' work, as I say, always with empirical data, gathered in the field, listening to students involved in conversations, and always between non-native speakers. She highlighted these four areas. Mm. And this eventually became known as the Lingua Franca core. And I would say is a very good starting point. You know, if you're trying to build up a pronunciation syllabus for your students, with an aim to them becoming internationally intelligible, then I would say the Lingua Franca cause a fabulous starting point. Possibly you might have to add one or two things because of your students' problems related to their first language pronunciation, but it, the, the Lingua Franca core with its four uh, areas is a great starting point. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, before, I want to jump in some of the comments, but... Um, if you want mm. to find out more about, about the Lingua Franca core, um, everyone who's watching, or if you want to find out more about everything Robin's been saying, some of the example he's been giving, um, we have a position paper, which Robin wrote. Um, there's a link to it down in the comments. Um, and yeah, this this paper was, was put together by Robin and a panel of our experts. Robin wrote the actual content. Um, and you can find a lot more of his thoughts and examples like this in this paper and a lot more advice that you can read in your own time. Um, lots of practical advice in there. There's also some activities at the very back of it, um, which can be very useful practically in the classroom. Um, so if you want to get some more ideas um, and hear more from what Rob about Rob similar things to what Robin's been saying, um, download that. Um, it's free. You just need to um, to fill in the form and, and get that. We'll send it to you via email. Um, but as well as that, I think what's really interesting is, um, is while you were speaking, um, I was looking through the comments and it's really interesting how a lot of people are mentioning similar problems. We've been asking people what struggles they face and a lot of people have been encountering similar problems to um to what you've been saying. So um so for example differentiating the f in the v sound in Indonesia and interesting how this is specific to Indonesia um and how specific areas and specific accents you need to as, as well as approaching the lingua franca core as you've said it's also about addressing those problems that you face because certain certain if you have a certain accent or you you have a certain first language you find certain pronunciations more difficult i, I mean it's interesting um sometimes mm, we can led we can be led to think that and in an ideal world our students would be out there communicating with students from multiple other first language backgrounds and they're going to have to work on their own pronunciation, sometimes ad hoc as well, in order to be understood, in order to do communication activities. And that's that's very nice. Hello, telephone. Let's get rid of that. <laughs> well, I thought I got rid of it. Um, that's, that's really nice. But actually, most of us work in the situation that you just put up there, Chris, where we work with students who have a common language background we as teachers share that language background and this is really great because you can then diff you can then highlight or, or quickly mm, determine which are the most uh, serious pronunciation problems that our students have mm. so this is the situation that you have here in indonesia uh, might be replicated elsewhere but the key thing is that because the teacher is living and working in indonesia and speaks the same uh, first language as the students, then they can highlight these sounds. And that makes our job an awful lot easier. I mean, when I'm standing in front of a load of students who speak Spanish and I speak Spanish, then I know what pronunciations they're going to have. And I know how to take the lingua franca core, the four basic elements, and add little bits to it or interpret it mm, in a way which is going to be optimal for me and my situation because of my students' shared mother tongue or shared mother tongues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's really interesting, and I think I think that does raise an interesting point in that um, in in some places, some some people th there are some opinions that people have that being a native speaker makes you a better teacher than a non-native speaker. But I think what you've just said there is really interesting because non-native speakers, because they understand the language and the language problems, they they can address those in a way that native speakers might not be able to. 
Um, so really, I don't think we can, like, I, I think one of the key points in the paper, which, which you've made, which I think is really interesting, is that we, we can't necessarily say that being a native speaker or a non-native speaker is better. Uh, they're different situations, and yeah. it yeah. will bring their own strengths. I think what's not happening at the moment is we're not highlighting sufficiently the strengths that non-native speaker teachers bring to the classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, So if you're teaching in Indonesia and you, your student's first language is your first language, then you bring wonderful things to the classroom that I, for example, as a native speaker of English, couldn't bring to the classroom. Mm -hmm. And the, the first of those is the fact that by learning English to the level you have as a teacher and by improving your pronunciation to the level it's now reached, you have successfully made the journey that you are asking your students to make. I have never made that journey. I was born in an English speaking world. So I can imagine what it's like for my students here in Spain trying to learn the pronunciation of English, but I can only imagine it. I've not done the journey. My Spanish colleagues teaching English here in Spain have made that journey and they've made it really successfully. And so that places them in a unique position. They can stand in front of their students and say, look at me, the only thing I want is for you to come with me and I'll help you make this journey. Mm -hmm. Which better guide, you know? If you want to climb Everest, who do you want next to you? Someone who was born at the foot of the mountain and looks on the mountain every day or somebody who's climbed the mountain and come back down alive? Mm -hmm. So this is a, re a real strength that non-native speaker teachers have. And that we as native speaker teachers, obviously, we can't have. We can try to imagine it. Mm -hmm. Because you've made a journey you're asking your students to make as a non-native speaker teacher, you have often greater empathy with the problems that they're having. But you also have little tricks and tips that you picked up along the way as you made the journey and that you can pass on to them. And again, as a native speaker teacher of English, um, I, I don't have so many. I'm, I'm acquiring them. I'm better than I was. But a, a teacher who's made the journey has got those tri uh, tricks and tips. The teachers that I've met as I've gone around, mostly my work's been done in Europe, but in places like Poland, teachers have got an, an enormous depth of knowledge of the phonetics and phonology of English and of the phonetics and phonology of Polish. And they're able to pass this on in the classroom to help their students acquire really good internationally intelligible pronunciation uh, very quickly. As a native speaker, when I started to teach pronunciation, the big shock was to understand that I actually didn't understand anything about the pronunciation of English. And this was a shocking moment because I realized I was a fraud. I'm up there saying, do it like this, but I actually don't understand how pronunciation works. Obviously, you do something about that. You're a professional. You've found a gap in your knowledge. But so many times traveling around the world, I found that the non-native speakers have been through university, they have a degree, they've done the phonetics and phonology of English, and they've done the phonetics and phonology of their students' mother tongue or mother tongues. And this puts them in a superb position in, uh, in order to go into the classroom and be really, really effective and really helpful with their students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have a another question now um, mm -hmm. to address because um, I think I think I think that was um, sorry. This is this has popped up now. Um, um, so I think this, yeah because this, we're, this we're, is we're, what yes. we, we looked at before, isn't it, Chris? No, 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 so so we're getting on a we have about before. yeah we so we have about ten minutes left. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to pop this up um, just to move us on. Um, you've talked a little bit about the lingua franca core. Um, do you have any other areas that you think are important for people to consider? I think what's really important is to consider what we now know in terms of international intelligibility of some of the areas that are not in that lingua franca core. So just briefly again, the lingua franca core was essentially the consonants. It was the vowel length features of vowels more than their actual qualities. 
it was the, the way we respond to consonant clusters if they are problematic for us. And it was the idea of, of uh, sentence stress or mm -hmm. tonic mm -hmm. stress. Okay, so this seems to leave out a whole bunch of things. Um, the first, one of the first most obvious is it leaves out word stress. Okay, well, um, perhaps we can do an extended lingua franca call because there is some data which is beginning to suggest that even for international intelligibility, word stress is a useful component. So we've now extended to five. But those five leave out a whole bunch of things that occupy pages and pages of work on pronunciation in course books. And I'm talking about things like the choice of tone. Does your voice go up? Does your voice come down at the end of the sentence? Does it go up to come down? Does it come down to go up? And so on and so forth. Um, in terms of the research that's been done so far, there is nothing to suggest that the exact choice of tone has any significant impact on your international intelligibility. Mm. And that's really interesting in so much as if it has no serious impact, and I am short on time, perhaps I can leave aside all of those exercises on rises and falls, fall rises and so on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something similar happens with stress timing the idea of uh, weak syllables and strong syllables. This is actually not a very good description of English anyway. It's, it's a little bit of a sort of um, simplification of how English works. But whether stress timing and syllable timing are, are real or whether they're something we've sort of invented, either way, it doesn't really matter. So again, you can look at your course book look at exercises where stress time is the focus of the exercise and think, I'm not going to do that. It doesn't have a serious impact on international intelligibility and I don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there are things like weak forms and schwa. And these, these reductions where vowels completely disappear out of words or where words almost completely disappear out of sentences because they are weak forms. Weak forms in schwa occupy masses and masses of space when it comes to the pronunciation work currently um, uh, um, seen in, in course books. For international intelligibility, both weak forms and schwa can actually be detrimental to being intelligible. So if you're trying to express yourself with in clarity for international use of English, mm, it's not mm. just that, uh, oh, I'm short of time, I'll leave it out. No, it's actually good practice not to get your students pronouncing weak forms or using schwa or other vowel reductions mm. because this makes the words less uh, decodable, shall we say, by the listener. This is quite, it's, uh, instead of actually highlighting again the lingua franca core, let's have a look at things that perhaps we need to start leaving out if the goal of That's interesting. Yeah. is international intelligibility. Mm. No, I really like that as an approach. Um, we, are, we are running towards the end of our time here today. Um, so I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to let everyone know, um, again, if you have any questions before we wrap up, um, pop them in the comments if you have any burning questions you feel like we've not addressed, um, any worries or concerns or stories that you that you would like some advice on. Um, just pop them in the comments. Let us know. Um, I do also want to, before we wrap up, shout out again that um, that we have a position paper on this topic, um, which Robin wrote, um, gives loads of great advice, goes into way more detail about English as an international language, pronunciation for a global world. Um, so you can find a link to that down in the comments. Um, I also wanted to to let everyone know as well that we actually have two webinars coming up um, on the topic of pronunciation. Um, one is going to be on the 18th, so in about nine days, um, and that's going to be ran by Jane Setter. Um, and it's about, um, it's Jane is also one of the expert panel who worked with Robin um, on, on behind the scenes on the paper. Um, and she's going to be talking about pronunciation for a global world, world at our webinar. Um, and then we have another webinar on December 2nd, which Robin will be delivering, which is very much focused on practical ideas 
um, and practical tips for pronunciation teaching. So if you want, if you want to hear more, either download the paper or you can apply, you can um, register for one of the two webinars, um, and that'll give you way more information. So yeah, if you want more, um, that's a great way of of getting more information. Um, I'm just going to see if there's any um, any final comments. Um, I think Vicky's picked up on my vowel length yeah. example. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Thank you, Vicky. <laughs> um, sorry, just, okay, that, that's popped up. Um, sorry, I was hoping that would pop up in the comments. Um, that link is to our webinar page in the comments. So if you want to, if you want to register for Robin's webinar or for Jane's webinar, um, you can follow that link and, um, and that'll, that'll help you do that. Um, okay. Right. Well, I think we, we haven't had any other comments, um, so far. Um, we have a couple of people saying hi and, and um, Patricia, and I'm really glad that you were happy with that. I think I've spent so long here in Spain, which is where I've done most of my, my teacher education work working with non-native speaker teachers who are so intimidated by the idea of teaching pronunciation because they feel that their accents aren't native speaker. And this is really sad because the outcome is that they don't work on pronunciation. And that is something that we can't afford to allow to, allow to happen. Pronunciation is, is too important to the business of successfully learning English. It's particularly central to the business of learning English. So we, we can't have a situation where the vast majority of teachers, because they are non-native speakers of English, stop teaching pronunciation because they feel that they are not up to the task. It's obvious that they are up to the task. They've worked very hard to get through an English degree. They have worked very hard on their own pronunciation. And as I pointed out before, they have such a special insight into what it is their students are trying to do. If, if people take anything away now from, from our, our event here, please take away that as non-native speaker teachers, you are fabulously placed to help your students improve their pronunciation, and this will help them use and improve their English. And as native speaker teachers, we're placed in a different situation. We need to recognize what that is, and we also need to recognize the weaknesses that we bring, as well as the strengths that we bring. Mm, mm. We're, we're coming at the same thing from different places, but mm. neither of us is unnecessary. Both native speaker teachers and, and non-native speaker teachers are necessary in the process, and they feed in and strengthen each other. It's a partnership. Mm. Mm. I really like that. I really like that. I think that's a great, a great note to end on, I think. Every everyone has their own strengths, um, and everyone can do it. Um, so thank you, everyone, today for joining us. We're going to have to wrap up now. Um, I need to let Robin go and get a cup of tea. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, if you like this live session, make sure to like it. If you loved it, make sure to love it. Um, please do share it as well. If you know any teachers that need this in their life, that want more information about pronunciation um, or want to download our paper, then tag them in the comments. Um, this really does help us out. Um, we also want to make these sessions all about you and the audience, our teaching community. So comment telling us what you'd like us to talk about next. Um, we often look in the comments and decide what our next event will be um, based on your thoughts. So if you have any anything that you really want to hear about, let us know. Um, make sure you're following us as well so you don't miss any of the sessions we've got coming up. We've got some great webinars coming up, some great events in future. Um, and we're we're at OUP ELT Global on Facebook, Twitter, and on YouTube. So you can find us there quite easily. Um, but last but not least, a huge thanks to you, Robin, for joining us today. It's been great having you here. I've I've learned a lot. I've read the paper, and even so, listening to you talk, loads of great insights there. Um, so thanks so much. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone. Okay. My pleasure, Chris. Absolute pleasure to be here. Hope it's been useful for people. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. And, um, and we'll see you all next time.
Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, Thanks. Everyone.